I used to really enjoy Rick Martel's work. Great worker. So what did you learn from a cat like that? So I had the benefit of working a program with him in Winnipeg because we had real strong TV in Manitoba. Now, what federation is this? Uh, it was called was first called WFWA, West 4 Wrestling Alliance, and then uh, Tony Candela, who's like an Italian Stu Hart, basically. Tony took, you know, said, look, I want you to take over the book and the TV production, and, you know, I was always his champion. So I said, we need to change this this promotion because it's too regional. Now, regional's cool now. It wasn't back then. Right. My vision was I want to use my friends' connections like Jericho and different bad news, guys who had connections in Japan and Mexico. I want to make our TV special, make it international. So I, we changed it to International Wrestling Alliance, and I would bring in you know guys from all Japan. I would bring in Ultimo Dragon from Mexico. I'd get Jericho to come in. And these guys would come in for 200 bucks as favors, you know, because that's all I right. could afford. Right. But, man, we had great TV. And so um, Tony always liked to bring a WWF guy to try to sell tickets. So I said, you know, that's cool, but bring one who can go. You know, like I respect the other guys. It's great. But if you bring one who can really wrestle. So he brought in Rick Martell. He'd only been gone less than a year. And uh, I was real nervous, you know, and, uh, and Rick didn't know me from Adam. And he just said, okay, kid, like we'll go out there or whatever. We called maybe two things. And we went out there. And I could tell he was enjoying it. We went almost 30 minutes. And he stayed out there back and forth, you know. And he said, like, don't touch my hair. Don't do <laughs> it. was all the rules, right? It's like, cool. So, <laughs> so we had, uh, had the thing. And uh, at the end of the match, we did a schoolboy finish, put him over. And he said, go get the bell. He said, gimmick me with the bell. So I went outside, got the bell, did the Randy Savage, came off the top, across the throat. They stretched him out. He just wanted to keep working it, right? So he came back for two years. We worked this angle over two years, culminating in a series of cage matches. And it was great. He was so easy, you know, and could work baby or heel, but nice. a great baby face. And um, so actually, the funny part was that it was 96. I'd had my tryout uh, with Vince uh, in, the, in the spring. And I had sent my tape in. And my tape, I was always a promo guy. Like I was, I would say I was a moderately average worker, but I was a above average promo. Yeah. So my tape had a lot of promos on it. So when I sent it in, Jay Strongbow calls me. He goes, man, these are some of the best promos I've ever heard. He goes, you remind me of Roddy Piper. He says, I'm taking this to Vince. Now I didn't know who Jay was other than he worked there, right? Of course, he probably handled a lot of the job guys, right? And I didn't want to come in and do jobs. Nothing wrong with that. But that wasn't, I was like... I'm giving myself two years to get a look, and if it doesn't work out, i got to go do something else. So well, I mean, that's, that's taking a realistic look into your future or, or what they yeah. can plan for you. So, so when I came for my tryout, Bruce, or, um, sorry, Chief took me straight to Vince. This is the guy I told you about. And he said, did you listen to his promos? And Bruce was there, and Bruce goes, goes no, no, we'll, hear it. We'll, we'll check him out tonight. Well, one problem, they weren't going to let me do a promo. <laughs> it was just like a dark match. One of my big regrets, Steve, is that, and what I should have done, and I would have gotten in trouble, I'm sure, I should have grabbed the fucking mic, and I should have cut a promo at the start of the dark match. And if I got heat, I got heat. And I always regretted not doing that. And so when I went to WWE, WWF at the time, and I was stuck with a shit gimmick with the Truth Commission thing, we are in Hershey, Pennsylvania one night, and they sent me out for a promo. And I'm like, if I do one more week in these friggin' riding pants and this red beret, like, it doesn't, you could be Kurt Henning and you're going to get killed with this gimmick. I got to change it up. So without telling anyone, I went out and changed my look, wore a motorcycle jacket, took my hair to the ponytail, ditched the beret, and I cut the kind of promo I wanted to cut. And it wasn't what they told me. And I thought, I'm either going to get heat and fired, which I'm going to be gone anyway because this is a shit gimmick, right. or I'm going to change their view. So I went out. It changed their view. They let me change the gimmick up. But that was the lesson from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, during the dark match. Do what you got to do to show them who you are. Because for me, you know, in Wisconsin, they saw that I was a guy who could work. I was 210 pounds, which back then, as you know, was on the small side. Not good. <laughs> And it's like, but I honestly think if I'd cut a promo, they would have had a different view. So coming off of that now, I've told the story before, but I went and saw our boy called Carl DeMarco in uh, WWE Canada. He watched my tape, said, you should try to look more like Ultimate Warrior. And I said, you mean like tassels? And he said, no, like his body. And I said, well, that's nice. Who told you this? <laughs> well, <laughs> Carl DeMarco. 
told you to look like warriors. Yes, he did. He said, that was what was holding me back. And I said, well, there's not many guys in the business who could look like that guy because that guy yeah. has one of the best bodies in the history of the business. Yeah. That's, so I just thought. Genetics and a lot of working <clears> out. And... So at that point, I was very close to just quitting the business because I went, if this guy's a president of WWE Canada and he's telling me this, and he has no clue, he's never been in a gym. I have no hope in this fucking business, right? So I went home. I was really pissed off. And then he called me a week later and he goes, hey, guess who saw your tape? And I said, I don't know, Carl. Like what? Ultimate Warrior? And he goes, no, Bret Hart. Bret Hart loves your tape. He wants to meet you. And I was so beat down in this business by that point. I went, Bret Hart, the promoter, the guy from yeah. Florida. And he goes, no, Bret Hart. So that started my relationship with Bret the Hitman Hart. And Brett just said, you know what? I can get you booked. You're not too small. You're the same size as Sean. Don't worry. Just keep doing what you're doing. And Carl then called me and said, I want to put you in a tag team with Adam Copeland, who would later become Edge. And, uh, and then, like, when it rains, it pours. A week later, Ricky called me right before Christmas. And he goes, hey, Don, I'm thinking I'm going to come back to the business. You know, I said, hey, good for you, Rick. You should come back. You're, you're awesome. You're only 38. He goes, yeah, but I want to do a tag team. And he said, uh, I said, oh, cool. And he goes, uh, I'm thinking Tito or something, you know. And he goes, no, I want it to be you. And he goes, because you got a good look. I had the long hair back then. He's like, you know, I think it would be good. You're a great promo. I'm a, not a good promo. He goes, and I, and I just blurted it out. I went, we'll be the supermodels. I just came to me. And, and now to do that gimmick, although they're kind of, there's guys kind of doing that now. Right. But in the 90s, the supermodel thing would have been a heat-seeking missile. Heat. And so uh, we went and met Vince, and, and which was cool for me, right? And that was the nice thing about going in with Rick. And I kind of chose that path over doing the Brett Carl DeMarco thing. Met Vince, and Vince, Vince is like, yeah, August 14th in Atlantic City, you start. We're going to shoot you guys on the beach walking around in a, in a couple of thong bikinis on the beach and, and I'm like okay and I was pumped and then you know Ricky was like said to me after he's like I'm not wearing a thong bikini on the beach I don't care you know blah 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 but Ricky wanted the guarantee and Vince was not given too many guarantees at that point uh, in 97 certainly wasn't offering it to us I could have cared less it was my dream to go there and then Rick, Rick ended up through Piper with WCW and kind of said, look, I can get you in there and get a look, but they don't want tag teams right now. And I just said, you know what? Like, I don't see me getting an opportunity to use the microphone in WCW with all the cats that were there in 97. I'm like, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go to Vince because that's my dream, and that's kind of the route that it took, I guess.